Welcome everyone to another episode of Into the Pit. I have here Mr. Eric Vitale, and we're going to get to no. know him. Yeah, man, what's going on? We're going to get to know no. you. We're going to learn uh, a little bit about what you do and just have a great conversation. So let's start it off. You tell everybody about you. Well, my name is Eric Vitale. I've been investigating the paranormal for about a decade now. Um, just turned 40. I grew up in New Jersey, a small town called Rochelle Park. And I currently live in Connecticut, hometown of Ed Warren, Bridgeport. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the whole paranormal thing kind of started really early for me. Um, my aunt and uncle lived in a really small town in New Jersey called Glenridge. And they lived okay. in a big old colonial house. It was like a best way to describe it. Um, it had those Amityville windows that most old colonial houses have. Mm. And I used to go there every, every weekend with my parents. And I remember one day we were all in the kitchen together and I saw a picture on the wall and it was a family tree that my youngest cousin Danny had made. And it had all my cousins on there. I had five cousins and my aunt, my uncle. And there was one other name on there, Murmur. So me being, you know, the, <laughs> the inquisitive young kid that I was, I'm like, who's Murmur? <laughs> so my cousin Matthew says, oh, that's just uh, Danny's imaginary friend. Well, that imaginary friend was actually a ghost that was making herself present only to Danny, the youngest of the children in the house. Oh my goodness. And as, yeah, and as the years would go on, um, I would start hearing stories. And one that always stood out was no one was home one night except uh, two of my cousins. I don't recall which ones, but two of, uh, I think it was Matt and Kenny. And uh, they, it was a big house. And they both kind of met each other in the hallway and they said, nobody else is home. Who is in the bathroom right now? The shower was running. So they had gone and uh, they knocked on the door and they thought that maybe somebody had wandered in off the road and was like taking a shower mm -hmm. and they opened the door. The water turned off by itself and steam came pouring out. And um, I was what? always afraid. Yeah. I was always afraid to use that bathroom when I was a kid. I would go all the way to the other side of the hallway to use the bathroom. Um, and I, I think it was more comfortable showing itself to, to children because Danny would see it. Different types of manifestations would happen to other people in the house. But my younger brother, Andrew, actually saw her one day. Um, he was taking a nap in one of the rooms and he woke up screaming and the best way he could describe it is the scene in Ghostbusters when Dan Aykroyd wakes up and the ghost is floating above him. And he saw this when he was like five years old. Oh, my gosh. Didn't do the same thing that that ghost did, though, right? <laughs> nah, I hope not. <laughs> Classic movie. You gotta love Ghostbusters. Oh, heck, yeah, man. So, you know, but, I had... Uh, so I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, but no, go ahead. No, no, that's cool. Go ahead, go ahead. I, I kind of have a theory about why children see things like ghosts. And, uh, you know, I don't know if uh, if, if you're a, a godly man or not, but... Uh, I am. I, I believe that because children are so innocent that uh, they're, they're closer to God in that regards. Because, you know, I think... Yeah. Uh, I think in Jewish tradition, about 12 or 13 is when you reach the age of accountability. But mm -hmm. I think because children are so close to God and they're they're just open that they can see those kind of things for a reason. Because what I've been told, everybody has abilities, but not everybody tunes into them. So exactly. I, I think you are right. But yeah, I'm sorry. I just had to throw that in. No, you're right. And, you know, young kids, you know, they're fresh from the spirit world. They're innocent. Mm. So, uh, yeah, I agree with you wholeheartedly on that one. I never personally saw her. There was uh, I was very close with my cousins, especially my young, the youngest, Danny, because we were the same age. And I remember one night uh, we were having a sleepover. 
like 1989. So I'm like, Oh my God, nine, 10 years old around there. And, um, he saw her, she was like sitting on a pile of toys. And I, I remember this moment. I didn't see her, but the way my, the way I remember it, it's like, I wanted to see her so bad, but I didn't. And like I said, I think maybe she was more comfortable with Danny. Danny lived there. I was visiting on the weekends though, but yeah, I never, I never saw her, but I definitely was scared in that house when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I had a lot of, uh, of experiences when I was a kid, but I never understood what I was seeing or hearing because I would hear a voice every once in a while. And I just thought maybe there was something in my brain that would click every once in a while. And I'd hear a voice, yeah. not, not knowing uh-huh. that I had this ability. Now I'm, I'm not going to sit here and tell you I'm uh, a psychic or anything like that. Cause I'd never really delved into it, but uh, you know, all these things that happened, I tried to explain them away. But when I look back and go, God, there, there's just, I don't know how that could happen. I said, I don't want to take away from your time. There's a hundred things I could tell you about. But uh, anyway, that's neither here nor there. Go ahead. Um, trying to think of other experiences when I was a kid. Uh, yeah, there. I mean, I would hear things when I was a kid. I remember one time, uh, I, I see, I remember this very clearly and it, thinking back it's like what what was I witnessing um I was really young maybe five or six and I remember being in my room it was you know bed you know I'm in my bed it's like the middle of the night and I saw in my room what looked like I mean this is gonna sound so crazy it almost looked like little like like gnome type entities like holding like stakes in their hands and they were in my room and I remember seeing this and just thinking, like, I couldn't even wrap my brain around it. And when I would tell my parents about certain things, you know, oh, it's a dream. Or I remember I used to hear, like, a banging noise at night constantly. And I would tell it to stop. And it would stop. And I, then I would tell it to, to speed up. And it would speed up. And I remember telling this to my father. And his eyes, like, lit up. And he, he told me just say your prayers every night, make sure you say your prayers every night. So I think he believed a little bit in the spirit world, even though now he probably won't admit it. (laughs) But I remember things happening and trying to talk to my folks about it. And uh, I don't know if there was something going on in my house, some type of a haunting, or if I was just opening up to the spirit world, because as I got older, I mean, look at what I do now. Right, right. There's no coincidence there. Oh yeah, everything um, happens and for I was a reason. Catholic too, so um, okay. you know my faith is strong. So it, most one of the most important things for me when I go out on any case is uh, I always make sure I have holy water with me and I have blessed um, Saint Benedict medals, third class relics. I wear I wear a vest every time I'm on a case. Anytime okay. I'm investigating, and it's not to keep various different pieces of equipment on me yes i have used it for that before but there's things in these pockets that are always there like holy water and sacramentals and third class relics um the more i do this work the more i tend to go old school i mean look at who my biggest influences are ed and lorraine warren they didn't have any equipment They, they would go in armed with their faith holy water crucifix um i'm tending to rely less and less on equipment the more I do this I wish I I knew that years ago and now I mean it's like I'm sitting here looking at a pile of equipment cases and I've got so much equipment when you know spirit box I mean I love spirit boxes I'm really big on ITC research intertransmental communication Mm -hmm. for those of you that don't know what it stands for I love using spirit boxes but I'm more so now I just want to go in talk to the clients get their story and then you know see and feel things and if i have to use the equipment to validate claims of a haunting i will whereas in the beginning i would just run right in there oh we got to use the spirit box right now set up a rem pod over there and Mm -hmm. put this over here charge the sls and now it's like you know you really don't need that stuff you really don't 
Exactly. It comes in handy at times, but. Well, uh, to me, I use it as a reference, like uh, the K2 yeah. meter. A lot of times you can go in and if you use your K2, you can find out where there's exposed wiring and what have exactly. you. Exactly. So. Exactly. Yeah. But um, I, basically all I'm trying to say with the equipment is I relied on it a lot more when I first got into this stuff. It's like, oh, we're going out. I need all this stuff. And now it's like, as long as I got my vest and I got my holy water, I got a digital recorder to record my clients. I'm good. So. You know what? We use the, uh, the uh, digital recorder. We'll use a night vision camera and yeah. something that really works especially for my wife because she does have abilities is uh the dowsing rods and you see there's certain i have a few pairs i never use them i just mm -hmm. i don't know there's certain things i won't do dowsing rods is one of them dowsing gotcha. rods Ouija board um to each their own i just right, feel right. like certain things if you're gonna ha have a spirit channel through you to to manipulate something i'd rather not right right that's just me that, that's just me now i've gotten to arguments with people like well what's the difference when you're using a spirit box it's like well when you're using a spirit box they're speaking to you they're using the white noise they're not channeling through me and that's right. that's just how i feel about it that's why i won't do things like the uh what the hell is it called the s the sd's method i believe where they blindfold you i've been on cases where people are doing that i'm like i want no part of it <laughs> i got you well you know the the uh, the reasoning behind the dowsing rods and you know they it's been used forever to locate things like water and yeah I know that yeah dowsing rods they work on the principle of like kinetic energy so mm -hmm. feel like we used to use them when I worked for the city to help locate things like gas lines water lines sewer lines because when you've got something flowing through these pipes, it causes that kinetic energy. And so that mm -hmm. once again, you know, when you have energy from a spirit, they'll usually manipulate the, the rods. It's not so much as a, uh, I guess, a beacon as you think for, you know, the spirits to come through your body and use. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, like I say, to each his own. Yeah, I, I don't I don't fault anybody for the their methods everybody's got yeah, their own way yeah i don't fault anyone there's just certain things i i won't do like you'll never see me using a ouija board ever you know <laughs> yeah i hear you well let's take a little step back into time here and i i told sure. you i would like to hear you talk a little bit about your music and I, I understand you were in a band when you were younger yeah um so i'm a huge metal fan and when i say metal i mean old school metal um i guess i'm dating myself by saying this my favorite band is metallica i yeah. grew up loving metallica um lars ulrich is the main reason why i picked up a pair of drumsticks so uh i started my first band when i was in junior high i was in eighth grade i was in a band called chaotic abyss and we played somewhere around 100 shows throughout new jersey and new york over the course of like 10 to 12 years wow um it was it was a good time we went up to uh newburgh new york we recorded an album there uh it was called misanthropic carnality um i did that i, I didn't even i wasn't even out of high school yet and i had done that um wow we, you know we we just we loved metallica i mean we our first show i don't know if i can remember the date but we played our first show uh i think it was january of 1997 i was a freshman in high school and um it was at obsessions in uh randolph new jersey so whatever we had a set list right and we had rehearsed um whatever it was eight or nine songs because we had like a 45 minute set to play there was like a bunch of other bands there that night it was like all local bands and we get up on stage and we were just like so excited to be on stage that that whole set list went out the window and we played like all metallica songs like we got up there and we all looked at each other and it was like oh game on creeping death master puppet seeking the yeah. show enter sandman just like one after another but um yeah i was always very much into uh heavy metal music 
you know, basically the big four, Metallica, Slayer, Anthrax, Megadeth. Um, but to this day, I, um, I just love those guys so much. I love Metallica. Um, I've hung out with them backstage at Madison Square Garden. They are so humble. And I just think Metallica, Metallica's music moves you like no other music can move you. I mean, I still get goosebumps to this day when Blacken starts. Enter Sandman, Master of Puppets. I'm getting goosebumps just talking about it. Um, <laughs> I've seen them 23 times live since 1996 was the first time I saw them. Wow. Um, I got tickets to go see them in Florida uh, at the Hard Rock Cafe uh, November 4th. That'll be my 24th Metallica show. And, uh, you know, they're still on top of their game. I mean, they're they're amazing. Metallica is fantastic. And it's a very, uh, it's like a spiritual thing with those guys. Like Metallica doesn't have fans. They have disciples. Oh, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. I know exactly what you mean. So I'm, I'm the old school Metallica. I, up till about the Black Album was probably about where I mm -hmm. cut off with them. I didn't really care for anything after that. Uh, when the Black Album came out, it was a little bit poppy for me. But, uh, well, but I mean, you know, that don't get me wrong. Those guys sell out uh, stadiums all the time and they're, uh -huh. they're an awesome band. I just, I'm, I like the old stuff. I'm, I'm an old fart. So. I remember listening to the old stuff when I was very young, but I also remember when the blackout came out and I was one of those fans that it's, I got sucked into like the phenomena of the black album. And mm -hmm. then it, me and my friends went and bought everything. At prior, Kill em All, Ride the Lightning, Master of Puppets, and Justice for All, you know, Garage Days Re Revisited. But um, I remember, uh, yeah, it's just great memories. I mean, I remember Load being the first album we had to wait for as fans, because like I said, I just turned 40. So that I was, I was in high school. Now, actually, no, I was in eighth grade when Load came out, I remember. And there was a lot of people that were upset, but I knew at the time, I'm like, these guys put out their first record when they were 18, 19. Obviously, they're going to want to try different things and i thought the load reload album was a good example of them showing their love for bands like acdc uh black sabbath so those records have a very special place in my heart i get super nostalgic when i hear stuff like until it sleeps king nothing um the memory remains um as far as i'm concerned they can't do anything wrong <laughs> i just love <laughs> those guys so much oh i i hear you well i was entering my teenage years when metallica first came out so uh, now i'm dating myself your first concert i was almost 30 years old <laughs> yeah it was uh july 11th if i remember correctly 1996 it was uh metallica was headlining Lollapalooza. it was at randall's island uh, so that was my first live experience with metallica and uh, you know it was gr a great memory i i absolutely loved it and then two days later <laughs> me and my band hopped into Monte Carlo and drove to Orange County with no tickets and walked right into the show. Like we are going in. We don't care. We don't have tickets. We walked right in. Wow. <laughs> That's some balls right there, man. <laughs> yeah. We, we, we just walked in. There was like, we were like 17 somewhere around there. Just, I don't know. I was a teenager. So we saw the guys standing there at the gate, like the security guards. I'm like, yeah, right try and stop us try and stop us once we walk through these gates and like we just disappeared right into the crowd yeah that's the, when we'd go to concerts uh, i'd blend in with the crowd to try to get up to the front and as i'm going mm up -hmm. um I'd, I'd see somebody standing up there and i'd, I'd go oh excuse me that, that that's that's my girlfriend up there uh, I'm, yeah. I'm just going to go stand next to her and i'd go stand next to him go hey how you doing you know act like i knew him those were the yeah, days. Yeah, that was always, uh, oh, yeah, it's like um, like uh, my fiance and I are going to see him in Florida. We bought seats because at this point, it's like I don't care where I am as long as I'm there. But I think my days of standing for like a few hours for opening bands and then Metallica playing two and a half hours, it's like I don't want to be standing that long. I just no. want to be there um, just hearing them, experiencing the live show. I'm just happy to be there. I mean. Plus, I don't party the way I used to. I mean, those early Metallica shows, I mean, oh, my God, I had to be carried out of a couple of those. 
by the <laughs> time the show was over. So, so live and learn. <laughs> what was Metallica your first concert, or that, or you yeah, just nice? Yeah, that, that was your that first was, one, huh? Yep. Yeah. Wow. You know what my Nathan first Lyons, one was? Lollapalooza. Who was that? Tom Petty and Bob Dylan. Oh, nice. Tom Petty. Yeah, he wrote some good tunes. In fact, the second band that I was in, it was called Blood Creek Massacre. Mm -hmm. I used to play Running Down the Dream. Oh, okay. Yeah, good tune. Good tune. Nice, nice. So I'm, I cut you off a minute ago. I apologize. Go ahead and finish what That's you're right. singing. Oh, uh, what were we talking about? Something, something about Metallica. Yeah, uh, Will. We we talked about that being your first concert. Yeah, yeah. That was that was my first show. Um, and like I said, I've seen them twenty three times. Uh, wow. I've been to hundreds of shows though, but uh, that's a whole other podcast. <laughs> Man, the, I mean, before we left Houston, my last concert there was uh, Molly Hatchet and Leonard Skinner. All right, cool, cool. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with a band called Merciful Fate. Came oh out yeah, so, heck yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, so uh, don't break the oath. Shows that, yeah, man, great stuff. So my band played at the Birch Hill um in old ridge new jersey a lot and we were friends with the owner because we met him at a merciful fade show mm -hmm. and um uh, he basically said whenever you guys you know want to come to a show here just call me come on down and uh you'll get in for free all you got to do is like unload tour buses and that type of thing so i ended up hanging out with so many bands when i was younger like fear factory but i remember hanging out with king diamond one night and like all the guys from merciful fate and I'm like 17 years old, like all starstruck. I couldn't understand a word anybody was saying because King Diamond's Danish and everyone in his band was uh, Swedish. And there we are just hanging out like in between the tour buses. I'm like, this is insane. Because at the time, like I was listening to the Merciful Fate like every day. This was like 98 when the Dead Again record just came out. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I hung out with a lot of bands back then. And it was because I was in a band and I was playing clubs you know smaller venues that a lot of bands that i really admired were at like typo negative i'm a huge typo negative fan i used to hang out with those guys all the time there in brooklyn um but yeah yeah lots of uh lots of shows back in the day lots of bands and, yeah i could spend all day long talking about concerts and bands and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff um now cannibal you, corpse. you know cannibal corpse yes i do my yes, band I opened up for them. <laughs> wow. Years ago, years ago, we opened up. It was us, Cannibal Corpse, Christian, and Niall at a club in New Jersey. It's not even there anymore. Uh, okay. I think it was called The Rec Room in Wallington. That was, uh, I think that was the second record with Corpse Grinder on vocals. It was the Gallery of Suicide tour. But yeah, that was, uh, that was another awesome moment. So, yeah. Man. Yeah, I tell you, I absolutely love music. Music is my life. I don't, I don't play very well. I have a bass guitar, but I'm not that good. But I, I don't care. I still like to sit here and you know jam, listen to music all day. That that's that's my mm -hmm. thing. Me too, man. Me too. I love music. It uh, it moves the soul. It's very important. Now, I'm I'm not trying to give any advertisement here or anything, but on Amazon Prime, they've got tons mm -hmm. of great documentaries on there on old bands like right uh, uh, what's his name, the Chris, the the guitar player from Wasp. I can't think of his name right now. Oh, um, oh, Chris Holmes. Yeah, Chris Holmes. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. I, I saw it. I saw that documentary. That was a great documentary. Yes, it was, but there's tons of great ones on there. So yeah, yeah I a lot can, of good stuff. I can spend a whole weekend just sitting there watching documentaries. Oh, me too. Me too. I love documentaries. So you're still playing especially drums, right? That into band. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I said you're no, still playing I'm drums, saying, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I still play drums uh, as much as I can. It's good exercise now, but um. What was I saying? As far as the documentaries, uh, if even if I'm not into that particular band, I still find their story fascinating. Oh yeah. But um, yeah. Have, 
I still play. I still play. Uh, I'm not in a band, but I, you know, it's like riding a bike. You don't forget how to do it. And I got my drums set up here. Um, I post a lot of drum videos on my Instagram page, actually. And it's just me just jamming. Plain hey, and simple. A- I just go up there. I play. Yeah, that's it, man. That, that, that's all it's about, man. Just get up and jam. So, mm-hmm. have, I love it. Have you seen that documentary on Randy Castillo? No, I have not. Oh man, that it'll break your heart, man. Really and truly, mm. that guy was awesome, and to go out like he did, it, it it if you don't at least tear up a little bit, you don't have a heart. Mm. What band was he in again? Uh, he, well, he played with Ozzy. Um, oh, that's He right. played that's with right. uh, I see. I, I want to say. Who else did he play with? Oh, wait, 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 wait. He was a drummer, right? Yeah, he was a drummer. I yeah, I know. Yeah, I think he was in Molly Crew for a hot minute. Yeah, he was. He was. Yeah, yeah, he played on New Tattoo. I know who you're talking about. Yeah, that right. guy is freaking awesome. He he had cancer and passed away, right? Yes, he did. Yes, yes, yes. But uh, he he didn't he didn't go quietly. Let's put it that way. He he yeah. was, he just had such a heart. And he cared about people, and, and he was so thankful to be where he was in life. The guy was awesome, and one of the very few Native American rock drummers. Mm. Man, I'm, I'm telling you, if you haven't seen it, go watch it. You will. You will yeah, love I'll check that. it out. I'll check that out. So, all right, so we've talked about uh, how you got into the paranormal. We talked about your music. Um, do you mind talking about uh, Ghost Loop? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Go for what it. What do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, just right. the, from the beginning and and uh, however in depth you want to get. <sighs> I'm gonna have to pour a drink for this. Oh man, um, <laughs> Ghost Loop. All right. So, um, somewhere in 2018, I was contacted by a woman who worked for a production agency, um, Kate Walker. She worked for, um, essential media. Mm -hmm. She had found me on Instagram because I was posting lots of, uh, photos of me ghost hunting, uh, investigating, and I guess they were just like looking up the hashtags, like paranormal, ghost hunting, stuff like that. So she gotcha. reached out to me and she was like, well, I'm putting together a TV show. And at first I was like, oh, this is a joke. This isn't real. So I called her, we spoke and she wasn't kidding. And she talked to me about the idea for the show and how they had a couple other people. Um, they had already picked out a couple of the other guys for the show and they, they liked my look, you know, t- tattooed, beard, earrings. You, know, you got a cool look. We'd like to have you on the show. So they told me the idea for the show. And I, right from the start, I'm like, well, that makes no sense. And I'm going to choose my words wisely here so I don't drop any F-bombs. <laughs> but they, they, the idea for the show was, um, first of all, she didn't know anything about the paranormal. So here I am trying to explain to her about different types of hauntings. So her idea was um, we're going to go into haunted locations where there's reoccurring activity and we're going to create trigger environments to try and spark it up and make it happen more often. So the more she's talking to me about this, I'm like, you know, you're describing a residual haunting and you can't communicate with a residual haunting because essentially it's not really a haunting. It's something that's imprinted in the area. Um, you have no show there. Right. <laughs> so we're going to look like idiots. There, you can't communicate with a residual haunting. Plus, the name sucks. Um, so uh, I tried to get her to kind of steer away from the name Ghost Loop and try and switch things up a little bit. But things started rolling rather quickly. Um, I sent in some videos and footage of myself. A couple other people were picked up for the show before long. There's five of us. And the show's called Ghost Loop. And they shopped it around. And Travel Channel loved it. Boom, here's your contracts. Oh, my God. 
okay, so now I'm finding out I'm going to be on TV. It's going to be on Travel Channel. I just keep thinking, like, Travel Channel? Travel Channel? Like, Ghost Adventures? This is incredible. So fast forward a little bit. It's now May of 2019. Mm -hmm. We fly out to Florida, and we spend about 10 days in Florida. It was the first case. And we filmed there. It was a pretty cool experience. Um, I really, I really dig that episode because we had a different showrunner. Um, this guy Keith. I think the cinematography was awesome. It came across like spooky. There was a a graveyard there. Um, it was just, it was really cool. So we did ten days, filmed it. It was my first experience. It was it was fun. It was crazy. Uh, I had no idea what I was doing. I kept stressing to people like the showrunner, like, look, I'm not an actor. So don't give me lines to read. Don't expect me to do any of that nonsense. I'm here to investigate a haunting and you're going to film us. Well, we didn't really have that much pull as far as telling the showrunner and the producers what to do. There is a bit of a format that we've got to go by and this day we're going to do this and this day we're going to do this. So it was... It was stressful. It was stressful because I none of us had ever done anything like that before. I mean, one of the other guys did like a mini pilot of a show uh, prior to the Ghost Loop thing. But, um, you know, we did our thing. We came back home and then we waited for quite some time. And there was a big hold up to go back out because the original showrunner got let go for whatever reason. I don't know why. And then they got um, some different people involved. So it was about from May to September, we were waiting. So then September 7th, which just so happens to be Ed Warren's birthday, I got on a plane and I flew to Texas. And that was the beginning of two months on the road filming seven other episodes. And I mean, I'm, I'm blessed to have had the experience. I mean, Alabama, Utah, Washington, Illinois, it was great. But I think it was a lot more stressful <laughs> than it was, you know, fun. I mean, for right. me personally, right? Um, you know, you get you get pulled out of your comfort zone. I, I I couldn't wait to get back home and be with my girlfriend. Um, plus, you know, we really didn't have much of a say. We had a showrunner. Plus, the new showrunner we got, I wasn't really too crazy about because she had done like house flipping shows and stuff like that, and I'm like, we are gonna look like idiots when the show airs and i just i wanted it to look a certain way i wanted it to have a spooky vibe to it i didn't want it to be bright and bubbly and i mean i like certain episodes more than others but i mean look it is what it is it happened it was two years ago now those eight episodes are on um destination plus i believe still right. like you can go and watch it right now if you want so it's cool i mean there's a lot of people that get into this field just because they want to be famous. Right. They want to get on TV. And I am not one of those guys. I don't care about being in the limelight. I'm very introverted and I keep to myself. I've got my core group of friends that I associate with the members of Nesper, my fiance, my family back home in New Jersey. Um, so yeah, I, um, I really don't care about the whole look at me, look at me aspect of the paranormal field. And I think that, uh, <clears throat> that's a big problem with the field right now is that there are a lot of people that are in it for the wrong reasons. Exactly. And if you want to go down that road right now, we could do that. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, you know, we had a uh, little discussion on Facebook live the other night. And one of the things yeah. that I brought up was the fact that there's so much drama in the paranormal field and it, not just on television, mm -hmm. but I mean, in, it's supposed to be a pair of unity, but it seems like you, like you said, people get into it for the wrong reason. They're looking to, you know, get that fame. I, I used to be on a yeah. team that the, the, the leader of that team, that's what she wanted. She wanted to be on TV and any opportunity she could, she stole somebody else's story just so she could be on a, a one of those reenactment shows and make it like it happened to her. And ridiculous. Yeah, exactly. Which, you know, that was many a year ago. I'm glad to be away from that drama. But uh -huh. I, tell, I tell everybody, if you're going to do this, 
You do it because you want to help people. You want exactly. to further what we're doing. You know, if, when you bring drama into it, then you're taking totally away from what the purpose of doing this is for. Yeah, there is. Um, I mean, that's my main thing. I want to go out there. I want to help people. I mean, look at mm -hmm. look at the team that I'm on. Look at who started it, and Lorraine Warren. What's most important when we take on a case? We need to give people peace of mind, and there needs to be an end point to their haunting. We need to help them. We are not just going to go in and try and get some evidence and then leave you hanging. We're going to try and do whatever we can to help you. And that's, an, that's another problem. There's a lot of people in this field they just don't know what they're doing. I mean, people could mm -hmm. buy the equipment anywhere. Um, I'm not trying to plug, but, you know, go stop. Right. For instance, like anybody could go on that website and buy a spirit box and buy all types of equipment, form a team and go out and start investigating hauntings. And they don't know what they're doing. You need exactly. to be spiritually protected. First and foremost, first and foremost, you need protection. And you got to be able to help these people. You can't just go in and try and get evidence. A lot of people, I mean, oh, my God, all the YouTube channels of just these amateurs running around, going into abandoned buildings, like it's cringeworthy. Yep. And they, they, nobody knows what they're doing. It's like, what's the point of this? To get a bunch of followers and to get a bunch of likes because you got some evidence in an abandoned building? Like, no. Yeah. If you're in this just for likes and followers, you're in it for the wrong reasons. Exactly. And, um, I just want to help people. And yes, I do want to gather substantial evidence to validate the claims of a haunting, but that's because it's part of it. That's not what it's all about, though. That's a piece of it. you got to be able to help these people. Well, too many people go in it with this ego. and Oh, yeah. They think, oh, well, you know, because they watched a few episodes of a, a ghost hunting show that all of a sudden they're an expert, you know, do like a, like most of us have done. You find somebody who has some experience in the field and you start out mm -hmm. under them. You learn as much as you can. And it, it, it don't just stop there. I don't care how long you've been doing it. There's always something new you can learn. But just exactly. take a little bit from everybody. I, I share yeah. what. You know, if we've thought up something, I mean, somebody else might have thought of it, but it's new to us. We'll share it with somebody because what you, they might be able to share something with you as well. I don't get this, mm -hmm. this whole drama thing. You said it, man. Egos. Egos. It's, uh, there's money to be made. People are greedy. I might get a TV show, this, that, and the other thing. Look, if that's if that's the gig you're playing, have fun. Yeah. It ain't my gig. I just want to get out there and help people. And I think one of the best things, one of the best opportunities I ever got, not the show, but when I moved to Connecticut, I was already friends with Tony Spera, Jimmy Petonito, who you had on your show recently, Dan Rivera, Chris Galoran, uh, you know, everyone on Nesper. And when I joined Nesper, it was like, I still crack jokes when we go out on cases. I'm like, hey, I'm Jason Newstead. I'm the new guy. You know what I mean? I joined my favorite team. You know what I mean? And it's an honor to be able to go out on these cases. Um, I mean, I just got on cases with Jim and Rick and Tony, and it's like these guys investigated haunted houses with Ed and Lorraine Warren. Who better than to have by your side than these mm -hmm. gentlemen? And I remember one of the, it was like the first legit case I went on. Uh, it was Jim and I and another investigator. This is a couple years back now, because I've officially been with Nesper for two years now. I joined um, the tail end of filming Ghost Loop. As soon as I came back home, I moved to Connecticut and boom, I'm on Nesper. So our first case, well, my first case with the team, we had a case in Groton, Connecticut, and um, it was pretty bad. Um, we went there without getting too into it. This woman was experiencing all types of activity in her home, seeing shadow people. Um, mm. she couldn't sleep, um, voices, all this stuff. So we go in and I'm not even kidding. Within like five minutes of being in this house, like I didn't need any equipment to tell me this house was haunted. I could feel it. 
there was a couple of moments where I thought I was going to black out, like get sick. I thought I was going to throw up and just black out. The energy in this house was so oppressive. And I had to step out once or twice. We were there for a few hours. Um, at one point, I was in a room with Jim, you know, after the, the interview, and we're doing a walkthrough. Um, handprints of children appeared on the windows. Mind you, we're on the top floor of the house. Mm -hmm. um, there was someone there with us, uh, psychic medium. She said there was a demon in the attic hiding. Um, I, I definitely felt it because, uh, man, I really did not feel good in that house. I really didn't feel good. That was out of all the investigations I had been on, that one, and I guess you could think of one other one, um, the Hanover haunting in Pennsylvania. I don't know if you're familiar with that one, but no. um, I really didn't feel good in this house at all whatsoever. And the rest of the day, I was just, my energy was drained, completely drained. Mm. You I know, made sure I had left the, the woman with holy water and blessed St. Benedict medals. And, yeah, uh, I, I think a lot more people would come out and, and have you uh, or tell people, hey, can you come investigate my house? Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, there are some out there that they think, oh, I'm, I'm going to get on TV, so I'll have these people come check uh, check out my place. But then there's those that are reluctant because, well, I'll put it this way. We've gotten calls and people say you know like um how much do you charge for this and like we don't charge anything nothing and nothing you're not supposed to <laughs> oh well the last team that we talked to charged uh, was like 75 dollars a room i'm like what yeah well shame on them shame on them they need to be exposed exactly that, that's that's ridiculous i wish i had their names because i would definitely say hey don't don't pay for that. You don't need to pay for it. Yeah, There's people, yeah. people that do it for nothing. Exactly. We don't ask for anything, nothing. We're doing this because it's what we do. It's exactly. what we do. It's, it's all about Hanover helping haunting. others. Exactly. Um, the Hanover haunting in Pennsylvania. I'm surprised you haven't heard of that one. Um, that was a big case. It's been on Ghost Hunters. The, uh, what else was it on? Um, a haunting. Uh, what was that other show? What's the one with Amy? Oh, Dead Files. Dead Files. Dead Files. There you go. I knew it was something. Files. That one. Yes, yeah, it's been on a handful of shows. Um, I've, I've probably I, heard it. I just don't remember. Yeah. Um. Deanna Simpson and her husband Tom. I investigated that house a handful of times. Um. I've been growled at in that house. I came under psychic attack in that house. Um, something froze my mouth in that house when I was on a staircase and it was the same staircase that the owner of the house was thrown down. Oh um, and when we left that house, the first time I was there, um, again, I felt sick to my stomach. I didn't think we were going to make it back to the hotel. Um, wow. it was bad. It was bad. Yeah. Look that one up. Hanover haunting. I'll, I'll do that. I'm sure I've, I've probably seen it. I, you know, I, I have terrible memory now. So, yeah, you talked about the dead files. I tease Jimmy uh, Petnito. I tell him he looks like Steve Deshavi. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, Jimmy. I can't Doesn't say he? enough good things about it. A little Doesn't bit. <laughs> if you ask him, if you ask Jimmy, he'd say he's a mix of – Fred and Barney from the Flintstones. <laughs> <laughs> I love that guy. <laughs> He's hilarious. I love him too. He's great. Good dude. Yeah, I could see me and him being really close. We we exchange uh, uh, Kiss gifts. You know the band Kiss. So because we're course. both big, we're big fans. So you know. I. <laughs> I was supposed to go see them a few weeks ago, and the show got canceled because <laughs> of. Uh, well, we were supposed to get hit with a hurricane. It yeah. never happened. Then they just kept rolling along, and then Paul got COVID, and then Gene got COVID. So mm -hmm. I don't know when they are going to reschedule that show, but I am going to see Alice Cooper in a couple of weeks, and guess who's opening up? Ace oh. Freely. Yes, I know they're com coming here to uh, 
well, it's uh, Cedar Park, just outside of uh, Austin, and they're playing at the HEB Center. And I want to go so bad. I just don't know. I've never seen Al Cooper. I'm super either. psyched. I'm more into like the '80s, early '90s stuff, like Poison and stuff like that. But I mean, I'm I'm just I'm all about it. It's like tickets were super cheap too, so I'm psyched. Yeah, I I want to go so bad. If you can see Kiss, go see them. I've seen them three times, and I actually met them back in 2010. Yeah. I'll tell you um, what. I'm hoping I, they reschedule the show. Let's hopefully. You know, Gene, I mean, he, I, he's not going to give he, up that money. Uh, he wants his money. I mean, if the guy could sell empty bags and say they're Kiss Air guitar strings, uh, pretty sure they'll be coming back. <laughs> oh, he could fart in a bag and sell it. Oh, yeah. He could fucking sell anything. I mean, they've oh, been on their. On now. That was the first F bomb. Like <laughs> yeah. You know, they've been on their farewell tour for 20 something years. I know. And there's a. So let me ask you. I mean, I'm a longtime fan, but I'm not like crazy, crazy diehard like I am a Metallica. Mm-hmm. But I need to see them at least once in my lifetime. So there's a lot of people that feel um, cheated because Tommy Sayer is wearing Ace Frehley's makeup. I'm, I personally am like, eh, whatever. You're getting the kid show. And Eric Singer wearing Peter Chris's makeup. I mean, I think Eric Singer might be the best drummer Kiss ever had. God forgive me for saying that. <laughs> well, I will tell you, number one, Tommy is one of the most personable, nicest guys. Very thankful for where he's at. He's, he's absolutely great. He stops and he talks to his fans, and um, the guy puts on a heck of a show. But I mean, it's not like he's the only one that's put on Ace Freely's makeup. So you know, there's other guys that have done yeah. it too. And you know, Eric Singer and uh, the other Eric, uh, Eric Carr, Eric Hart, fantastic drummer, amazing yeah. drummer, Eric Carr. Yeah, his story is very sad too. I, that'll bring a tear that's, to your I eye. Yeah, I saw the documentary. Um, Eric Singer, though, I, I just remember uh, I remember when Alive 3 came out. Mm. And I remember listening to the tape for the first time and hearing Eric Singer play Creatures of the Night. I'm like, oh, this is the best this song ever sounded. Thunderous drummer. Amazing. I was a little kid when Kiss started. I remember, uh, I'm, I got, a, I got, uh, what do I got over here? I got Destroyer on 8-track, because I, oh, wow. I do like to collect. Yeah, I got I got that on 8-track. I got a pile of Kiss vinyl, because, I mean, it's it's American culture. I mean, yeah. it's, it's like Coca-Cola, you know? <laughs> you should see my office. I, all the walls and everything are completely covered with something Kiss. I'd, I'd I'd, say I'm standing in my office right now, but in reality, I mean, it's a man cave. I got to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, mean, I got so a, much stuff in here. <laughs> I got a desk, a computer, and my other gear, and the rest of it's nothing but kiss stuff. So I don't know, man cave, yeah, office, whatever you want to yeah. call it. Yeah, all my Metallica stuff. I mean, I have a whole shelving unit with all my Metallica stuff. Then I've got a corner with all, I'm a huge Friday the 13th fan. I've got like so much Friday the 13th stuff. Um, yeah, there's just a bunch of stuff in here. All my paranormal books, my DVDs, you, you know, know, boys and their toys. <laughs> you know what I would die for is if I could get another t-shirt with the crash course and brain surgery on it. That was my favorite shirt. Oh, you could find them. Go, go on, um, go on Metallica.com. I'm pretty sure it's on there because they do reprints now okay in fact i am my, my closet i've got about 80 metallica shirts in there everything i've ever had since i was a kid whichever ones i still have is there any that i don't it's because i ended up giving them to ex-girlfriends god knows how long ago but i got about 80 metallica shirts sitting in my closet but a lot of them don't fit anymore so i need to rebuy favorites like yeah. i don't know if you remember the executioner shirt from the black album tour Okay. I love that shirt. I got to rebuy that one. You know, I had so many concert shirts, 
and some of them were just getting old and I didn't want them to fall apart or like I said, they don't cool. fit anymore. So my yeah. wife, my wife took all my shirts, found this lady who made it all in all my shirts into a blanket. And I she, knew you were going to say that. I've seen yeah. that before. That is so cool. It is freaking awesome. She even made me a couple of pillows with uh, some of my shirts right. and it's, it is Why like the coolest. That was like one of the no, best cool presents I ever got. Get rid of that stuff. Exactly. You don't want to get rid of that stuff. I still have all my concert shirts. All man. of them. Every Metallica show I've been to. Man, I've got Quiet Riot on there, Metallica, Kiss. Uh, let's see. I think there's Cinderella and Poison and all these other bands. It's it's ridiculous. Cinderella. Godsmack. Great band. Yeah. All bands I I admire and i'm pretty sure i've seen all those bands i've never seen uh cinderella i saw poison years ago i saw poison with rat actually oh yeah i i have too you know i partied with uh ricky rocket and bobby doll nice what tour was that oh that was uh i think it was the second or third year of the uh the glam rock tour or whatever it was called they, they would they would come to houston every year it was glam fest that's what they called it and they would have oh so this was like recent like they're doing the whole comeback thing yeah this was in the, the early 2000s all right uh, that's when i saw them actually yeah i want to say it was like late 90s when they started and then it was the early 2000s man they've had bands like cinderella rat slaughter uh that's bullet cool. boys i mean any i remember all Quiet those Riot. bands yeah the hair yeah. metal bands <laughs> exactly oh those when were the I, days when i saw poison i think they had just put out a cover record and it was like the early 2000s and i saw them uh pnc banks art center in homedale new jersey so i went to so many shows there but uh yeah, all bands. You know, that's a guilty pleasure. I shouldn't even say that on the air. Yeah, I like some hair metal bands. It is what it is. <laughs> oh, hey, you know what? Those that was my teenage years. So I, yeah. I'm I'm you know, always gonna love it. Um, uh, Shout of the Devil is like in my top ten all time favorite records ever. Um, mm. I love that record. I still, you know, be, uh, Motley Crue, great band, great band. They're another band. I've seen them a handful of times live. I love those guys. Yeah. Another great band. Um, a lot of good tunes, but yeah, Metallica will always be <laughs> number one for me. Oh, I, I don't blame you. I mean, that's kind of the way I, I feel with bands like Kiss and Godsmack and Rob Zombie. Those are like mm -hmm. my favorites. I mean, Metallica, I love Metallica. I seen uh, I seen Rob Zombie a handful of times. I I met him like Captain. twenty years ago. I remember. God, he's uh, short. At, at at Ozfest, I remember. I uh, met him. I got a picture, and the picture came out really bad because it was not like a disposable camera. Mm -hmm. I think it was like 2001, and I remember uh, he had just finished playing his set, and I had said to him, uh, this was before House of a Thousand Corpses came out. And mm -hmm. I'm like, I can't wait for your movie to come out. And he's like, yeah, me too. <laughs> Yeah, I I wished I had gotten into them, when, uh, you know, a lot sooner, but the first album that I got into was the Hellbilly Deluxe, and then, of course... Yeah, that was his first solo record. Right, well, I mean, you know, he had White Zombie, and I wished I had gotten into them earlier, you know? Yeah. But he's been around, a, he's been around a long time, dude, really. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know. I remember even before his solo stuff, I was a big fan. I mean, Astro Keep, 2000, um, just great, great stuff. They're in a league of their own. Happy he went solo. Um, he's he's a genius as far as I'm concerned. His music, his movies, Rob Zombie, cool dude. I, I got a funny story to tell you, but uh, I, I kept trying to find another job, and that's when he first – you know, could start emailing people your resumes and stuff like that. And I kept saying, why am I not getting a job? And so my cousin says, well, it's probably your email address. I'm like, well, what difference does that make? But my email address was Astro Creepo 4. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah, yeah, you had mentioned that on the, uh, the podcast you did with Jim. That, that is funny. <laughs> That's good stuff. Um, I, I, 
I tell you. I, I'm just, I'll always be a metalhead, I guess. Oh, me too. It's in your blood. It's in your blood. I mean, right. plain and simple. You, you, you definitely have to have it running through your veins because it takes a special kind well, of person to be like us. Well, exactly. That's why I was saying about Metallica. It's like, you know, Metallica's music moves people in a way other music can't. You know, and that's the same, you know, for metal, but Metallica in particular. But yeah, you really, I mean, if you're, if you're not just, oh, yeah, I like a couple of Metallica songs, it's like, no, these, yeah. these guys are the best. <laughs> I just about know the lyrics to every freaking song from uh, Kill 'Em All to the Black Album. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. you, mm -hmm. And then, of course, Megadeth and what have you. I mean, Anthrax. I got a funny Megadeth story for you, but I don't know if we, if I could tell the clean version of it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll do it. So I'm at, I'm at a Megadeth concert like 15 years ago, and it was like Megadeth, Lamb of God. Uh, I don't know who else was there. I've been to so many shows, but um, I had gotten backstage and I was going to meet Megadeth and I was with my younger brother. And at the time, um, he, you know, he goes through band members like underwear. So I don't even know the other guys that were there. I think Dave Illifison, no, Dave Illifison wasn't even there. This is when he was out for a hot minute. Um, so anyway, so I meet all the guys in the band, shake their hands and then I get up to Dave and like, it was like slow motion. I just passed by. And before I know it, I'm like away from the table and I'm holding my poster. Everybody signed it. And then I turn around and I look at him and Dave Mustaine's pointing at me and my brother. And there's a guy next to him pointing at us. And he called us um, a rather um, not nice word. And <laughs> oh my gosh, he liked that we were. Well, we were both wearing Metallica Ride the Lightning shirts. Oh, no. And he didn't like, he did not like that. He did not like that at all. And this was years before, like, they made up and everything and everything. You know, they're all cool and fine and dandy now. But this was, like, early 2000s. So then um, they go and they play the show, and they end up playing the song The Mechanics, which, if anybody knows, that's a song he wrote when he was in Metallica. Mm -hmm. And Metallica put it on Kill 'Em All and renamed it The Four Horsemen. Well, when he played it at that show, he talked a bunch of junk about Metallica and cursed them out. And I'm like, I wonder if he's saying all this because I got him riled up backstage because I was wearing a Ride the Lightning shirt. But yeah, I'll never forget that. I felt more bad for my younger brother. I mean, he pointed right at us and burnt the hole through us with his eyes. And he's just like, you effing guys, like, are you kidding me? And a rather derogatory word that I'm not going to say, but I couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe it. It's some sometimes it's best not to meet your your heroes because you'll be disappointed. Hey, let me tell you, the only reason I wanted to meet him, um, the only reason is because he was in Metallica. That's right. It. I could care less that I was going back there to meet Megadeth. I wanted to meet Dave Mustaine, who played guitar in Metallica before Kill 'Em All was released. That was it. That was it. You know, the only person that I would gladly hear being called a name from would be gordon ramsey uh, i mean i'm like you, you've got to call <laughs> me a donkey or a donut or something <laughs> that's funny that's funny hilarious <laughs> well sir i think our time is drawing to an end and i want to All right i want to thank you so much for taking time out of your day i know you're busy and all the you know getting ready to, to be married and all those good things Yes, sir. Good things are happening. Well, congratulations to you. I, I wish you all the Thank best. You. And um, hopefully we can all get together sometime in the future. Hopefully. If you want it bad enough, it will happen. Manifest your dreams. That's right. That's right. Well, you know, eventually I'm going to be hanging out with Jimmy. So uh, you got to be amongst that, that crowd. So. <laughs> yeah, he's about forty minutes from me in uh in Connecticut. So uh, yeah, you're coming. You're coming to Connecticut. Um, I, I'm trying to talk him into coming to Texas. All right, ooh, Texas. You got good food there. That's right, man. <laughs> I'll take you to the best barbecue spots in Texas. Nice. But uh, hey, you should come to one of the events. You know, uh, Mustafa comes here quite often, and and uh, we mm -hmm. we get together and. We have a great time, so uh, 
Who knows? Sounds, sounds good. But anyway, I want once again, thank you for anybody that's here for the first time. We're glad that you stopped by and you checked us out. I hope you come back. If you haven't already, please subscribe, like, share. Uh, please leave a comment. If you like what I'm doing, tell me so. If you don't like what I'm doing, tell me anyway. And for those of you that have continually come back and, and watched or listened to us, thank you so much for your support. Uh, you have no idea what that means to me. Every time I get a new subscriber, I, I, it's like walking on cloud nine. I really, honestly, truly appreciate it. So once again, Eric, thank you. Thanks to everyone. Thank until, you. Until the next time, take care. God bless. and. Peace. Oh boy.